My name is Jill Bebout, and I have the honor of introducing our storytelling lineup this evening. But just a few things before we get started. Um, it's tough to stand up here and, and lay out your story for the crowd, so I'd ask that you uh, participate in a couple courtesy things. Please turn your phones on silent or vibrate. If your phone happens to go off and you need to make the call, please exit the auditorium before you do that so you don't distract the tellers. And unless you are PFI sanctioned, please no flash photography. It's really distracting. Enough. Our first teller this evening is Arlen Kaufman. Arlen owns and operates Green Ridge Family Farm near Weldon, Iowa, with his wife Sue and his, their five children. The operation started with square bales in 2008 and today includes laying hens, cattle, and soybeans, alfalfa, and small grains. Please welcome Arlen Kaufman. Yeah! Thank you. When I felt that heavily, fully loaded manure tank shift the back end of that big tractor sideways in the middle of that soft, single lane dirt road, I knew I was in big trouble. When it ended a few seconds later with a terrible crash, the only sound in my head was a little voice saying, what will Uncle Morris say now? So Uncle Morris was in some ways a typical Iowa farmer, about my size, 5'10 five, five, to 12. He had dark hair. He combed it neatly. He had a nicely trimmed beard. He was a diligent worker. But there were some things about him that were unusual. He lived by himself in a trailer on his on his farm of, of bare to finish pigs and crops. He never married, he never had children of his own. And so he enlisted the help of his nephews whenever he could for the farm work. And my father was not a farmer. We lived a mile down the road. So I was one of the lucky ones from the tender age of 11 or 12. I helped Uncle Morris on the farm, take care of the pigs and their poop, farm the land and build buildings. So Uncle Morris was, was kind of unique in that he built every building on his farm by himself, almost by himself from start to finish, with the help, of course, of his nephews and family. Maybe not so much because he couldn't afford a, a contractor, but because he doubted whether they could do it to his exacting standards. So we, when, when we built things with Uncle Morris, everything was done right, and it was made to look right. So it didn't matter if it was underground, it still had to be square. You had to have the concrete walls thick and lots of rebar. If you, cut, if you were cutting barn metal, it didn't matter if it went behind J-trim. It still had to be cut in a, neat, in a neat fashion. If you were cutting a board, it didn't matter if the board wasn't attached to something. You still had to square it up with a pencil and cut it square. So it had to be done correctly. Not only was he great at building, but he could also repair farm machinery to be better than new. His philosophy was, if it breaks and you need to fix it, fix it better so that it, you don't have to fix it again maybe in a year or two. And I once, I once heard him remark that he kind of wishes they would leave the electronics out of things so that when it breaks, he can fix it with a torch, a sledgehammer, or a welder, and a welder. So it was a little difficult to work for him in those early years. He didn't see any reason why anyone, even if they were 11 or 12, putting forth sufficient effort couldn't meet his standards. And not always were those easy to meet. And sometimes uh, the, um, the admonishment was, was a little tough, was a little crushing to deal with. But I learned to respect Uncle Morris uh, in my years of working with him all the way up through my teenage years. I never heard one word, one curse word come out of his mouth that I can recall. So I learned to respect him. I left the farm a little later on in my, in my uh, early 20s. I took a teaching job at, a, at our uh, congregation's small Amish Mennonite school, and I wasn't on the farm as much. And then there was an opportunity to buy a farm around the corner 
from Uncle Morse, and he encouraged me to take the opportunity. And so with thanks to those of you who were paying your taxes back then, I got a low interest beginning farmer loan from the government and purchased that land. And I worked it uh, after school and on Saturdays and throughout the summer. But I, but I borrowed machinery from Morse. That was how it worked. And it, it worked nicely in exchange for helping him on his farm. So we, we kept up that way. So it was that on a beautiful, clear, blue-skied November afternoon, Saturday afternoon, I laid my schoolwork down and I headed to the farm. The air was filled with the, you know, the, the sweet dust of crop smell, the gentle throb of diesel engines mixed with the honking of Canadian geese, bright blue sky, and I was going to haul hog manure from Morse's farm up to my farm, it was, that was what I relied on for my nitrogen input for the coming corn crop. And today was the day for me to do that. It was working out that, that I could borrow the machinery, use the manure from his farm, and go. So I got there, loaded it up, got, got up into the big machine, the a big John Deere tractor with a 9,000 gallon tank behind it with four giant flotation tires on each side. And this tank, in, in order to, to, to make it work well around corners and in the field, the front and rear axles of this tank turn relative to the hitch of the tractor. So it works really neatly, uh, kind of like a giant serpent. And it can become, as I was about to find out, a very slippery serpent. But I enjoyed this opportunity, not so much, I wasn't hugely in fond of, of machine work, but believe it or not, even even Amish Mennonite scholars can, can cause one to desire therapy sometimes. And, and driving a big machine that didn't ask questions, it just did exactly what I told it to do with all 400 horses, was kind of like therapy for me. <laughs> Up until this point. So loaded the tank, took off from my farm. It was hard surface and then gravel and then dirt road for the last little bit. So just before I got to that last hill, to my farm, I stopped and talked to the neighbor who was mending his fence. I didn't get that chance very often, but I stopped there and talked to him. I got back in the tractor, put the parking brake off, and accelerated down that last hill. Big mistake. I should not have accelerated. So I failed to, to comprehend that there at the bottom in that soft dirt, it wasn't muddy, it was just big, soft ruts a disaster was awaiting. So I accelerated, probably by the time I got down to the bottom of that long dirt hill, I was probably doing 13 to 15 miles an hour. I should have been doing like six or eight. But anyway, when, when that tank hit those ruts, it shifted it sideways just enough to push the back end of that tractor over. And immediately I reacted to try to get the tractor back into the middle of the road. But when I turn like this, guess what? The back of the tank goes like this. And so I go towards this ditch, and I correct to try to get to the middle, and then the tank pushes me toward this ditch, and so I correct, and I'm just desperately trying to keep this 73-foot machine from in between the two ditches. And there were about three giant whiplashes until all of a sudden I saw it, the end was coming, and I cried out to God for help, but there was a tree and a culvert, and we were headed straight toward it. There was nothing I could do. The tractor went down, and just before I hit the tree, the, the tank came up behind, the tires caught, rolled on its side, and with a giant crash, it went up on its top and came down. And the tractor stopped, immediately installed, and I hit the console with my chest. And then all was quiet. Except for the little voice inside my head saying, what will Uncle Moore say now? There was no way to, to know except to find out, right? So I pulled out my flip phone, managed to dial him. Hello? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I crashed the manure tank. Silence. Are, are you okay? I, I don't know. I, I think so. And then what he said next really kind of took me by surprise. 
He said, do you need me to bring any toilet paper? So in, in, this, in this particular situation, there are only two possible reasons why you would need toilet paper. And I've never gotten around to asking him which one he meant. But I knew when he said that, that it was going to be okay. Well, the manure, the manure spill had to be contained. It had to be cleaned up. The tank, we had to get a crane out, set the tank up, limp it back to the shop, put it in the shop. And I knew without being told that I would be expected to help fix the damage. Uncle Morse, he, he made a few comments about maybe reducing speed on the downhill side, but he didn't spend a lot of time wringing his hands, blaming. He said that he would help me fix the tank, which is good that he did because I'd probably still be working on it after how many years. But anyway, we got, we got jacks and torch welder parts and we beat and we heated and we fixed and after a while we got the tank back into pretty decent shape and he said well we got it to this point why don't we go ahead and paint it and so we sandblasted it and painted it and when it was done it was actually quite a bit nicer than it was in the beginning now uncle morris has been gone for just a little over a year he went on to his eternal reward. But this story will always be with me, and especially it comes up when I, when I get into situations of disaster. So this is something we all have in common. Disasters happen. Maybe they're physical, natural, spiritual, whatever, whatever kind of disasters. Some are caused by me, some are caused by you, some are caused by God or not, depending on your theology or lack of it. The rest are probably caused by either the Republicans or the Democrats. But anyway, <laughs> disasters happen. So when disasters happen, then what? But Uncle Morris's example is an example that I aspire to live up to. He extended grace. He helped by working together. We worked together to fix the problem, and it was made even better than it was before. That's an example I would love to live up to. Wouldn't you? Well done, and thank you, Arlen, and we should all be so lucky to have our own Uncle Morris. Our next teller is Daquan Campbell. Daquan is the founder of We Arose Co-op and raises vegetables for his community on an urban plot in Waterloo's Fourth Ward, his home neighborhood. We Arose is a local network dedicated to elevating urban farming, building community, and increasing access to local and affordable healthy food. Please welcome Daquan Campbell. All right, Arlen, I don't know how I'm going to top your story, so uh, thank you for setting the bar very high there. Um, so my story begins on an early Saturday morning in September. If you can imagine Saturday mornings in September at the farmer's market, you can imagine the cool, crisp temperatures. You can uh, see the leaves on the trees turning. You can envision a shift in available produce from the long summer months of tomatoes, cucumbers, and summer squash being available to a shift in winter squash, pumpkins, leafy greens being piled high at the market tables. Um, at this time, my farm business, we are farming on a quarter acre, uh, operating at a very small scale. Um, we are distributing our products twice a week, once at a Friday roadside and another at, a, um, at the Saturday Farmer's Market, which is where this story has taken place. Um, and I don't know if this is true at all markets, but at our market, um, there's usually a handful of customers that come to the market 15 to 20 minutes early every single week. And 
Um, on this particular day, I remember about 15 to 20 customers just kind of walking around the market, either conversing with their fellow market shoppers, uh, talking with some of their favorite vendors, or like some uh, patiently waiting to get their hands on uh, or get first dibs to the available products that day. And I would say probably about five to 10 minutes before the market bell rings at 8 a.m., uh, one of our loyal customers comes up, and her name is Miss B. Uh, Miss B, she's mid-60s, my skin complexion. I give her 5'3", five, 5'4", five, on a good day. Um, and she kind of gives that grandmother feel. Um, she has been supporting us week in and week out at this point. And she kind of comes up to the table. She greets me, greets the staff that's working with us. Um, and she's doing all this with a smile on her face. And she starts to scan the table, see what we have available. Um, and I notice when she gets done sc uh, scanning the table, she looks up at me and her facial expression changes. And she goes, where's my greens? And instantly I kind of feel this sense of shame and guilt because one of the issues that we were running into at that time, uh, being that we were operating on such a small scale, is that we would run out of certain products at our Friday stand and wouldn't have enough available for the Saturday market. And we kind of strategized and thought about uh, kind of holding some of our products back so we can have a nice looking table on Saturday. But um, the truth is that that Friday stand is very close to our garden and that's kind of our target market and core audience. So uh, we made sure that those customers who frequented that uh, roadside stand had access to all that we had. So um, I kind of stuttered through this very simple sentence of telling her that we didn't have any greens available and that there would be about another week until we had some available to harvest in the field. And she, at that point, she kind of already had the knife in me. You know, she had this very sad and um, disappointment on her face uh, once I eventually stuttered through that sentence and let her know that we didn't have any. And at that point, she kind of turned the knife because she shared with me that she had uh, family members coming from down south and that she was very excited to share this experience about our fresh greens uh, with her family members because it reminded her of home. Um, and the fresh greens that I'm speaking of are very specific crops, uh, mustard greens, turnip greens, and collard greens. A lot of you may be familiar with the turnip greens. A lot of people use the bottom, the root. Um, but in the, the black community, it's a very culturally relevant product. Um, and oftentimes, these are utilized as cooked greens, not salad greens. Um, and I'm not the chef, but I'll give a, a quick rundown on how... Uh, we usually prepare those greens. It's usually boiled and brought to a boil in some water, maybe some vegetable or chicken broth, uh, seasoned to taste, and some type of smoked meat added to it. Uh, but when you're cooking these greens, it's a huge undertaking for the customer to um, prepare those greens and get them ready to cook because you have to wash the greens. And a lot of customers talks about how that, you know, that takes a, a fair amount of time. Um, and the reason she was so invested in our product was because that our greens became uh, pre-washed and bagged. So essentially taking all of the work out of that, uh, out of, uh, from the customer, and we're doing that, you know, kind of before it gets to market. They're already pre-washed and they're essentially ready to cook. Um, so she, you know, still is, you know, telling me how disappointed she is. Um, and I eventually point her to another vendor who had a very similar product at the time, uh, the same products, but uh, they would be bunch greens, how most people are used to uh, receiving them. Uh, so probably 15 to 20 minutes goes by. Uh, she kind of grabs my attention before she leaves the market and, uh, you know, raises up the bag and said, I got what I needed. Uh, we had another brief conversation. Um, and at that point, I started to share with her some of the concerns that we were, or challenges, I should say, that uh, we had at the time. Uh, we were operating on a pretty small scale. Um, we... I was very early in farming. I'm still a beginning farmer, but at that time, I really was kind of wet behind the ears, if you will. Uh, didn't necessarily have my crop plan down or understood succession planting, all of those things. And when I was sharing those things with her, she probably was receiving that. These are just a bunch of excuses. Um, but it was, it was uh, me being very honest and transparent about where we were at that time. And I remember her stopping me in the middle of those uh, different challenges and her saying to me, you'll figure it out. And she kind of reverted back to that grandmother love, if you will. You know, it just kind of, she said, you'll figure it out. But what I heard is, I believe in you. And essentially saying that, you know, you have done uh, the best that you can to serve us. I'm very excited about the, the crops and the products that we get from you. I know that you will, you know, figure it out and uh, do what you can to serve your community to the best of your ability. 
So um, I go home that day. Uh, there's a lot that transpires at farmers markets. And one of the things that I like to do is just kind of jot down notes about some of the things that may didn't go right at that market, uh, things that we see as areas of opportunity. Because if you, most people know, if you're vendors at a farmers market, you know, if you try to uh, wait until the off season to address some of these things, you're going to forget all of the great ideas that you had. So I hop in a Google Doc, I'm starting to put down different ideas of, you know, how can we better utilize the land that we have access to? Um, how can we gain more access to land? And I remember one of the third things I put on that Google Doc was how can we collaborate with other local producers, uh, like-minded producers? So I would say probably another week or two goes by, and I had a conversation with a gentleman that I feel um, this conversation kind of changed the trajectory of my farming career. And this gentleman is named Schaefer Ridgeway. He is the owner of Southern Goods um, right out in Waterloo. And we had mutual friends at, the po at this point in time, but hadn't ever really had a conversation. Uh, Schaefer asked me how my story was going to go. He didn't know he was going to be in it. So uh, he's, he's sitting right here uh, at the front. Um, and at this time, you know, he was telling me how he was doing a soil health project. Um, how he had a desire to grow popular southern foods that weren't readily available in Waterloo and how he was farming on two to three acres at the time, I believe. And to a guy, that may not seem like a lot of land to some, but to a guy currently farming on a quarter acre, uh, that was a sizable jump. Um, and I remember just this kind of light bulb went off in my head. And I think those words uh, from Miss B, you'll figure it out, continue to play in my head. And I think um, that is why I was so open to these conversations and didn't necessarily see them as issues, but as areas of opportunity. Uh, those words from Ms. B saying, you'll figure it out. Um, and you know, I remember Schaefer and I continued to you know, uh, build a strong friendship. We started to exchange, we exchanged contact information, started to exchange ideas, whether it be I listen to a podcast and send it his way, he goes to a conference and kind of share with me what he's learned. Um, and from there, we started to be very intentional about collaborating with other local producers. And I think it wasn't that easy. Um, you know, it sounds easy to collaborate with other producers, but we went through so many different peaks and valleys. Um, and I think what helped me stay the course was Miss B's words. You'll figure it out. Um, challenges such as, you know, how do we uh, price our products? How do we uh, come up with a business model that benefits multiple local producers with very different operations? Because although we're considering working together, you know, all of our entities are very different. And another issue would be during crop planting time. Do we collectively crop plan? Do we uh, do crop planting and production planning that's going to complement the different operations? Or do we continue to stay in these silos and, and work alone? Um, all of those things kept rearing its head and all those questions we had to navigate. Um, and Miss B, you know, being at the, 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 at the forefront of my mind of you'll figure it out, helped me stay the course through those things. And I think uh, what I can say about us being very adamant about um, elevating cooperation amongst local producers is that I now realize that we are much stronger together. Uh, there's strength in numbers. And as a result of that, uh, we arose starting off at that quarter acre neighborhood garden has since transformed into a co-op with five local producers and on any given year 15 to 20 acres of land dedicated to fresh fruit and vegetable production. And now Miss B and other folks in our community don't have to worry about getting turned away due to us not having enough product. That's my story of being on common ground. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Daquan. And I think Miss B had it right. Her faith in you was well placed. Our next tellers are a team. Tom Wall and Kathy Dice launched Redfern Farm near Wapolo in 1986 and now grow over 75 species of fruits and nuts. They are dedicated to education, research, and practicing perennial polyculture at their farm. Tom and Kathy are lifetime members of PFI and recipients of PFI's Sustainable Ag Achievement Award. Please welcome Tom and Kathy. So, we bought our first 55 acres back in 1986 at the depth of the farm crisis for around 
$270 an acre. It was rugged, steep, wooded land. We had no intention of farming it at first. We were wildlife biologists by education and occupation. So this land suited us just fine. But in 1990, Tom was exposed to the ideas of holistic resource management. And from that, he developed an idea to reinvent agriculture using trees, bushes, and vines. Agriculture was going to solve all the problems of modern industrial agriculture. So we started with planting chestnuts, but soon added persimmons, pawpaws, uh, pecans, hazels, um, Asian pears, and about 60 or so other species of um, fruit, nut, and berry producing trees, shrubs, and vines. Yeah. You can see why it's a team. Okay, so, so all of those take a lot of time to come into production. And so we tried several side hustles to generate income while we waited on the trees. <laughs> we tried geese, ducks, boiler chickens, turkeys, geese, and sheep. <laughs> ah, mm. Thank you, and goats, yeah. Okay, now I'm blanking. Oh, Tom was constantly evaluating new plants to put into the system. Not everything worked out. There was rock elm, for example. Yeah, rock elm was highly prized for uh, wagon wheel spokes for its uh, ability to resist splitting and rotting. <clears throat> I found it to be slow growing, you know. After 20 years, we have enough rock elm for three wagon wheels, folks. Now, I project that within 50 years, we'll have enough for one whole wagon wheel. Uh, the, the problem is demand for wagon wheels grows slower than rock elm. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> So we also struggled with weather. We had one winter where it hit 37 degrees minus Fahrenheit. That was the actual temperature, 37 below zero. That was not wind chill. We had an eight year long drought. The cracks in the ground got so wide and so deep, we could have dropped an eight foot two by four down one and lost sight of it. Yeah. Um, our area got a hit by multiple floods. We've had three derechos hit our farm. But eventually, the trees did begin to start producing. And by 2013, Tom had been running the Chestnut Growers Co-op for 13 years. He was sorting, bagging, and marketing chestnuts for over 40 farms across the Midwest, including ours. Uh, back at that time, most of our the co-op customers were uh, Bosnian people from Waterloo. Uh, folks from Western Bosnia are fanatical about chestnuts. They have told Tom multiple times, This is our favorite food in the whole world. Um, in Western Bosnia, there's been a tradition of going to the forest each fall to harvest chestnuts from the wild trees. The whole family would go. If you were too small to harvest chestnuts, your job would be to sit on the bags of harvested chestnuts, guarding them from other families. The big holiday was Castaneda, which means Chestnut Festival. It was kind of like the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, and Christmas all rolled into one. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Dojic family from Waterloo um, had been a really good customer for the Chestnut Co-op for several years. but. One day, they made an unprecedented request. They wanted to come to our farm and pick their own chestnuts from the ground. Uh, now, 
you got to understand, these people are from Waterloo, a really big city with traffic lights and everything. <laughs> the idea of city folk wandering out on the farm unsupervised was really scary to me. I was, what if they stepped on a honey locust thorn or into a hole or got lost? Uh, I was afraid of liability and whether our insurance would cover it in case of an accident, and I really did not want to do this. The Dojic family explained to us that their dad had stage four stomach cancer. He wanted to harvest chestnuts one more time. It was his dying wish. No, I couldn't say no. <laughs> so I said, okay, but don't anybody. So their plan was they'd arrive early in the morning, they'd pick until late afternoon, but due to car trouble, um, they ended up arriving around 1 p.m. Their new plan was they would pick until dark, sleep in their pickup truck under the chestnut trees, and then start picking again in the morning and pick until they had enough. An ice-cold feeling of dread crept down my spine. I imagine it was probably really similar to that feeling when the back of a tractor shifts sideways. <clears throat> Uh, I, I pressed him for more details. They said mom and dad would sleep in the cab and uh, son and daughter-in-law would stretch out in sleeping bags in the back of the truck. There were thunderstorms predicted for that night. I had a vision of city folk answering nature's call, getting lost in the dark, wandering around aimlessly in the midst of a raging thunderstorm until finally getting struck by lightning. Uh, Tom did check on them several times during the afternoon. Uh, they seemed to be finding a lot of chestnuts, uh, but the dad could only pick for about 10 minutes and then had to rest for an hour in a lawn chair they set up for him. He was really pale, sweating profusely, even though the temperature was a pleasant 70 degrees. I was afraid he was gonna drop dead any moment. It, it did rain that night, but no thunderstorms. So I checked on them early the next morning. They were already back to picking. Um, they're ready to check out by 11 a.m. And I was astounded to find they had picked 513 pounds of chestnuts. <clears throat> the Dojiches were exhausted but ecstatically happy. Um, as they were leaving, I reminded them of their promise not to tell anybody what they'd just done. We suspect they didn't keep it secret. <laughs> Within three days, we had a list of 20-some Bosnian families who wanted to come pick chestnuts. A year later, it was 70-some. Now it's over 300. Uh, Nowadays, most of our UPIC customers come from Waterloo, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, Davenport, Des Moines, or Ames. But we regularly have customers now coming from Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, Sioux City, and Fargo. That's North Dakota. Um, 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 the vast majority of our customers were born and raised in parts of the world where chestnuts are already uh, known and loved. Um, places such as Germany, France, Greece, Serbia, Croatia, Japan, China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Nepal, Tibet, and many, many more places. We now you pick pawpaws, persimmons, Asian pears, heart nuts. Almost all of our fruit and nut sales is now for you pick. Uh, the switch to you pick has been life changing for us. Um, it's drastically reduced our costs of harvesting, uh, sorting, sanitation, packaging, refrigeration, um, and advertising. It's, it's been the major factor in our switch from struggling to successful. 
Uh, we tend the groves of trees. We make it comfortable for the customers to come and pick. The more comfortable they are, the longer they stay, the more they pick, and the more we earn. You could say the trees have helped us find common ground with people from all over the world. Thank you, Tom and Kathy. I'm fairly sure that Redfern Farm is Iowa's worst kept secret. But, you know, talk to them. Maybe they'll start a sign up for those rock elm wheels when I, I hear it's a possibility. Our final storyteller this evening is Margaret Smith. Margaret is a forage agronomist for Albert Lee Seed with previous experience working for ISU Extension and the Iowa State Department of Agronomy. She and her husband, Doug Allert, operate Ash Grove Farm, a diversified certified organic crop and livestock operation near Hampton, Iowa. Please welcome Margaret Smith. Yeah. Bill, let's do a sound check here. How's this? A little bit closer, okay. I'm not sure if I can clip it to my bottom here. How's this? We better? Great. My husband, Doug, and I are not expert livestock handlers, but we've gotten better over the 29 years we've been married. During that time, we've raised a cow-calf herd. We started our herd with uh, RX3 heifers from uh, Dick and Sharon Thompson's herd. We've had a Katahdin sheep flock that was built from our son William's 4-H flock. We've helped our son uh, Robert with his sow herd on pasture when he was raising for Nyman. And we've also raised broiler chickens. Doug is a very calm personality, and you might think he just appears that way on the outside, but, but after observing him for all these years, he really is pretty calm, and he maintains that calm while he's dealing with livestock. He is, however, a silent communicator and expects me to know what he wants me to do about three clicks before he wants me to do it. Now, I'm not as calm as Doug, but I'm not a wild woman. I keep my cool pretty well, when we're working with livestock, and I really learned this from my grandpa growing up. He always spoke softly and moved slowly around our cattle and was really a, an expert cattle handler. Uh, a reverse of Doug, however, is that I'm a verbal communicator. I want to talk it through. Let's make a plan. <clears throat> so we have a little bit of conflict going there, occasionally. We've been students of Bud Williams, more sounds. Well, golly, I don't know what to do here. We've been students of Bud Williams. Are we any better? Nope. Nope. I'm sorry. Thanks for your signal. How are we now? Better? Can you turn it up? OK. OK. How are we, Kayla? It's rarely said that I'm too quiet. <laughs> OK. We've been students at Bud Williams and low stress livestock handling for a number of years. And we understand those principles quite well. Now, there's understanding and there's practice, but you, you learn with practice to get better. We understand flight zones. We understand applying pressure, releasing pressure to get animals to move. When you're applying pressure, 
You want to be in their line of sight, so you don't want to be right behind them, but off to the side. And that cattle, in particular under stress, want to return to where they've come from. We were living in our first home. It was an acreage surrounded by land that we rented. There was a little bit of infrastructure for livestock, uh, an old barn and a small lot, but no infrastructure for grazing livestock whatsoever. Our house had been built in the 1890s, old farmhouse added onto a couple of times. And in, in the kindest way, I'll say it was well ventilated. <laughs> it was so well ventilated that we got to enjoy bits of nature study throughout the year in the house, you know, based on the seasonal influx, influx of various insects and wildlife. We built a good perimeter fence on this rented ground, four strand, high tensile. At this time, we were grazing our cows in the fifth year of a five year organic crop rotation. And that interior fence then would be two strand that Doug would move each year. And the daily moves were made with a single poly wire. So our cattle were well trained for electricity. They wintered in a, a pen behind the house and occasionally were in a makeshift pen around our bin site that had a little bit of forage available and we, we put them in there occasionally to keep down weeds. Now, it's a good question for farmers everywhere. Why would you have a great four strand perimeter fence and then seal the deal with a single hot wire at the gate opening? Jump from an alligator clip. Well, gates are expensive. Now in retrospect, that's false economy, but gates were expensive. The fall that Robert and William were about seven and eight, they were at a stage where they were still just so ecstatic about helping and working on the farm, but they were also the age where they were good help, capable to do it. It's a golden era. Um, so in my observation, there are three, and, and experience, there are three main situations in moving, we're talking to talk about cattle here, of moving or dealing with cattle and where you need low stress livestock handling skills. The first is where you're confined within your perimeter, maybe your, your fence, you're either moving from paddock to paddock, maybe you're in the lot, you're working cattle through the gate, maybe you're loading out. The second is when they're outside your perimeter. Maybe you're moving them down the road to a new grazing cell or maybe they've just gotten out. And we're about to experience the third, or what I call the graduate level of livestock handling, when we received a call one night about 1230. Your cows are out from our neighbor Jim Jorgensen, down at east of us. Now, we've learned before we respond or, or do anything, when we receive that call, which we have had before, was to ask what color are they? We had the only red cows in the neighborhood. So Jim, in fact, verified they were red. Okay, everybody up. So what we'd also found that it's a third or graduate level of livestock handling, which is the cattle are outside your printer and in the dark, you need more than two people. So everybody up, down the stairs, throw on your boots, socks are optional, throw on your jacket over your PJs, grab a hat, grab the flashlights, Where's the headlamp? We only had one headlamp at this time, which was also false economy. Headlamps are the greatest invention ever, right, for working outside in the dark. Found the headlamp. Outside, grabbed a couple buckets from the barn, scooped a little bit of oats. We all jumped into our old red Ford and headed down toward Jorgensen's to find our cows. We found them about three to quarters of a mile from home. And along this path, some of our neighbors had fences and some didn't. So you know, they could have been anywhere by then. They were still pretty much on the road. When we located them, we jumped back out of the pickup and using our best cattle handling skills that we had in the dark, we actually did get them turned around and headed toward home. And I thought, well, th this is going better than I thought it would. We started for home at a very slow pace, Doug in the pickup, William on the tailgate, banging the buckets together, as much bang as you can get from plastic buckets. And Robert and I bringing up the year with a rear with our flashlight and headlamp. Now Doug's in the most important position in the truck because you have to go very slowly. If you get going too fast and those cattle start to run, you've lost them. So we're, we're working gradually toward home, Robert and I using our best skills and try to apply pressure and release pressure. Although once they got going, they, they pretty much were on a regular clip. We had to 
make past one crossroads on the path toward home, and I thought, well, this could be a problem because cows are moving along the road, they're moving in the ditches, and when they come to that crossroads, they really want to turn in the ditch. They don't want to go up and over the road and back down in the ditch. So Robert and I hustled around as best we could and got ourselves up on those crossroads and got them past. And I thought, well, that went better than it might have, and I thought it might. At this point, I was feeling pretty good. We had about a third of a mile to get home. Kept moving slowly, wilming, banging, or clunking the buckets, and got to the farmyard. They had to turn 90 degrees into the farmyard, but there weren't any fences or gates, and they'd done it before. So Robert hustled himself over to the left and got him turned in the farmyard. Good for him. At this point, we just needed to get up to the gate of this bin lot. They'd, uh, the cattle had recently been brought in, um, the calves weaned, and so luckily the cows weren't with us. That could have been a real rodeo. But the cows are weaned, and the cattle had been in this kind of temporary bin lot I had described earlier. We got them up to the gate, and, and I thought, we're home. But we weren't. There was a stop. There was a standstill. They would not go through that gate. Now, Bud Williams will tell you, if the cattle aren't doing what you expect them to do, you're not understanding your cows. And it's probably something wrong with you or your lack of understanding than it is with the cows at all. So to try to push them through this gate, I just we couldn't figure it out, but we thought, we're so close, we're going to try. They had to turn a 90 or almost 100 degree curve to get into this gate. And cattle have a preference to go back in where they've come from, but in this case, they just couldn't seem to make that turn. We tried to push them once, and they started milling around. And oh, when they start milling, you're, you're, you may have trouble. If you push too hard, they're milling around, they're turning backwards. If you push too hard, they're like mercury, and they're going to squirt out the sides. So we backed up. Now, we'd been operating pretty much on nonverbal communication. We, we pretty well knew what we were doing here. But at this point, we needed to switch to verbal communication. So I step up. And I said, back up. Give them room. They're agitated. I'll make sure I <laughs> where I back up here. So we let them calm down. And I said, let's try it again. Just put a little bit of pressure on, step forward. So we have a little semicircle with four of us around this group of cattle, and they start milling again. And one of those mercury cows shot out the side. And I thought, oh, we're in trouble. Stop. Everybody stop. Back up. So when you try something like this, and if you get them agitated more than once or twice, you can get yourself into real trouble. So I know we need them, give them time to calm down, both us and them. So again, I said I usually stay calm, but I'm, I'm a little past my calm stage at this point. Move back. So we all did. I said, we need a plan. Now right here, I heard, right then I heard this plaintive little voice of my eight-year-old, Mom, I'm kind of cold. And I'm like, oh, I thought, we do not have time for this. <laughs> And, and I'm not breaking the barrier of us four, even though we're only about 40 yards from the house to go get something warm. So from the mom who's usually, are you boys bundled up? Do you have your hat? Do you have your gloves? Now don't get cold, came. Oh honey, you'll be just fine. Just, just put your hands in your pockets. We're almost there, you can do it. So I'm thinking we need a plan. Everybody think. I thought back to about three years previous, it was in August. And if you remember our house that was well ventilated, we had bats in our bedroom. Now, it's not the first time we'd had that. Um, and we were working on our, we were trying to locate where they came in and hadn't done so yet. But we we're working on our, our, pat, our bat exit strategies. We started out with a technique of tennis rackets and trying to uh, encourage them out the bedroom window. Well, the light's on and you're batting at bats, they get agitated, and then the kids get agitated. And, and that never worked very well. So this time we decided to change our tactic. We had changed out our tennis rackets for old window screens that we kept in the closet. So we grabbed the window screens and kind of reversed our strategy. I said to Doug, 
you know, I don't know if you can herd bats, but they have flight, a flight zone. They don't want you to be around them. And they want to go toward the dark. So we took our persuaders, the window screens, and got them out the bedroom door, shut the bedroom door where the light was. They'd flown into the dark hallway, turned the light on there. Then we persuaded them down the staircase into the dining room, shut the door to the stairs, turned on the light in the dining room, and subsequently encouraged them with this light and dark and our window screens out into the kitchen, into the entryway, and then out the open front door. Now, it, this actually was kind of fun, and I thought, well, this worked better than I thought it would. <laughs> Back to the cows, where it's not going so well. We need a plan, and then finally, I looked at it, I looked at the turn they had to make into that paddock, and I said, you guys, they can't see where, they're go where they need to go. Doug, can you take the pickup around, shine those headlights in that gate opening, and let's try that. So we backed around, it was a little crowded, we were by the grove. He got that truck backed in, turned on the headlights. Robert, William, and I took one step forward. First cow went through, and they all went through. Success. <laughs> so we shut the gate, such as it was. Doug walked the perimeter to make sure there weren't any other uh, breaches in that paddock. We went back in the house, warmed William up, found he didn't have any socks on in his boots, and of course went to bed. A couple days later, I was reflecting on this uh, nighttime outing, shall we call it, <clears throat> and feeling pretty smug because I thought, well, this really went better than it might have. And I thought, plus, what a great metaphor. Show them the light and lead them, to their way, lead them on their way. But then I thought, well, the cows needed light, but the bats needed dark. And children, well, children need different things at different times. William really did need a warmer coat and some gloves, but I had to, to uh, substitute in the instance with just building a little self-confidence. <laughs> so I don't think we had a metaphor at all. What, I, what I, my takeaway was, I think really a truism instead, whether it's livestock or wildlife or children, my message really was, give them what they need, and they'll find their own way. With sometimes just a little bit of pressure from behind. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you for for uh, showing us the light and hurting bats. And I think a lot of people in here would probably argue that Doug and Margaret are expert livestock handlers. So that's it for our evening show. Thank you all for joining us. I'd like you to join me in giving our tellers one last big round of applause.